Thanks very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank God it's Monday. Uh, today's uh, presentation is on de minimis value uh, express shipment exemptions and its impact on global trade. Uh, this is a uh, webinar hosted by Carson International and uh, uh, Miller Thompson, uh, a national law firm in Canada. Uh, with me today is my co-host, uh, Dave Pentland a uh, very senior and experienced customs broker. And, and my name is Dan Kisselback. I'm a lawyer and partner with the law firm Miller Thompson, and I lead the global trade and customs practice at Miller Thompson. Next slide, please. Uh, this information is intended to be uh, information only. It's not intended to be advice. And if you need uh, legal advice on a specific problem, we would encourage you to seek a qualified uh, practitioner. Next, please. Dave, a little bit about you, uh, a man who needs no introduction. Yeah, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in Canada. I'm um, pleased to uh, attend uh, this session with Dan again and take a quick look at e-commerce uh, evolution around the world and de minimis rates. Um, I'm Vice President of Compliance at Carson International. We're a Canadian and a U.S. customs broker and international freight forwarder. Uh, head office in Vancouver, but offices across Canada. So, a little about, bit about me. I'm a, a lawyer uh, with over 30 years of experience, licensed to practice in Ontario, BC, and New York. And uh, I have been dealing with uh, customs matters for several years and uh, have had the pleasure of working with Dave and uh, mutual clients uh, uh, for a number of years now. Next, uh, please. The minimus. Uh, so uh, we stuck in a cute little quote to tax and to please no more than to love and to be wise is not given to men. I suppose the, um, the reading you give to that is that it's impossible to please uh, men or women through taxes. Uh, I think that's self-evident. Uh, so taxes are inherently unpleasant and we want to manage costs out of the supply chain um, where at every opportunity. So uh, a little Latin uh, lesson today, uh, de minimis really refers to the long form of the phrase de minimis non curat lex. Um, if you say that three times and click your heels, something will happen, I'm sure. Uh, the, uh, the law does not concern itself with trifling matters. And so this is a, 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 a phrase and a doctrine and a rule that applies in various areas of the law. Um, and uh, in, in this context, it is used to refer to the fact that certain um, values, uh, back up for a second, customs, duties, and import taxes are assessed on the basis of the value for duty. And so the law, um, by legislation, uh, uh, countries have said, uh, we're not going to worry about uh, values that don't reach a certain level. So if they're below this threshold, then they're considered to be de minimis. The law doesn't concern itself with de minimis or trifling levels in the customs context. So it's not large enough to worry about. De minimis by country, um, there's no worldwide de minimis level, right? Uh, countries have different contexts, they have different needs, they have different interests, and uh, so they set their own de minimis values based upon domestic legislation. So in Canada, there are, as you will see, are certain remission orders that have been uh, issued, which uh, provide for um, the de minimis thresholds and the duty-free and the import tax-free entry of goods into Canada. And similar legislation is set out in other um, contexts elsewhere in the United States uh, and in Europe and elsewhere. So uh, the thresholds, uh, they range between a dollar and a thousand dollars US. Um, there are preferments, I would call them, uh, associated with being under the wire, under the de minimis threshold which may include more streamlined border clearance. So if you are importing goods that are below the de minimis threshold, they may uh, receive a more preferred treatment uh, than um, 
than other goods that come in in bulk and, and are massive and, and high value uh, uh, imports as, as bulk orders. So we've referenced here uh, the um, two main ones that we see, the postal imports remission order and the customs import remission order, which provide for the de minimis thresholds in Canada. In the United States, uh, and, and you'll see this later, there's, another, there's a piece of legislation, uh, section 321 of uh, 19 USC 1321, which describes the, the US de minimis levels. And uh, so uh, it's important to have regard to the country specific de minimis thresholds if you're trying to plan to take advantage of the uh, duty-free and import tax-free entry of goods into a country. David? Yeah, I guess it's a good place to point out that the, the reason we're talking about de minimis today is that um, uh, the number of digital buyers around the world keeps uh, escalating. And uh, in 2020, there's over 2 billion people purchase goods online. And it's estimated that it surpassed $4.2 trillion. And so it's just mind boggling that uh, traditionally shipments come in and have to be categorized and declared to customs regimes around the world, they cannot keep up with the volume of e-commerce. So there, by, and we're gonna take a look at it a little closer, that uh, the reason that you have de minimis around the world is certain countries have certain levels and certain things they want, still want to protect. At the same line, you, uh, at the same time, you can't slow down uh, global e-commerce. So it, it's just a fact that, um, e-commerce is going to evolve. And, and, and to throw another wrench in there, the whole COVID global pandemic has been a multiplier effect on uh, e-commerce e growth. So. Yeah, uh, to use a Canadian analogy, I guess uh, uh, growth has been going up like a hockey stick. And uh, Very um, uh, there is a Forbes article that describes that um, growth um, and um what is happening, uh, according to the um, folks that really watch this very closely, is a very durable uh, change in the way that um, commerce is being transacted, especially in the retail sector. And so there's a lot of momentum and durability in the change and the switch towards e-commerce. And uh, it's expected to just continue growing exponentially. So uh, with that, uh, we've talked about a little bit about the uh, variance between countries' de minimis levels. And here we've set out some of the uh, differences, for example, between Australia, um, the duty and, and taxes kick in after the first uh, thousand. In Canada, it's uh, $40 and uh, $50, $150 uh, for um, duties and taxes. So you have to be really alive to the differences uh, in the country's de minimis thresholds. And some uh, countries don't really clearly define them. So, uh, so that's, that's one thing to be aware of uh, if you're importing and exporting to other countries. On to the next uh, slide, please. So uh, Canada uh, entered in, into uh, the new NAFTA with the United States and Mexico. Um, there were certain things that um, uh, the countries agreed to. Um, they agreed on a base level, um, this uh, fact that uh, goods should be um, entered into uh, the countries at, at a de minimis level, duty-free and tax-free, but they didn't agree with the uh, respective to, to agree to a certain uh, common uh, de minimis level in Canada and Mexico and the United States. So you're going to see quite a different level uh, at the second last paragraph for the United States. That uh, de minimis level remains at $800, which is substantially more than the Canadian de minimis level, which is $150 Canadian. So there has been some friction uh, over that. And there are planning opportunities that may arise as a result of that. And what we are seeing sometimes is folks uh, deciding, well, we, we might want to have a Canadian hub uh, so that we can import goods into the United States uh, duty-free. 
rather than importing them bulk into the United States and paying um, duty on them. David? Yeah, I mean, it's, and to point out is that part of the reason they could not agree on it is that Canada, unlike Mexico and the United States, we have a national tax program. And so that $150 is exemption from duty, but it's not exemption from uh, GST, HST, or PST, or QST. So only goods up to $40 so uh, are truly exempt from duty and, and tax in Canada. So it, it's something that, you know, um, we're seeing a number of uh, companies are deciding that um, U.S. e-commerce goods, there, there's an opportunity to be held in Canada and um, there's no real transit delays. Maybe you might pick up an extra day, but get with a competent 3PL. Um, we work closely with one who uh, they've seen a real uptake on um, companies deciding to put U.S. e-commerce goods in Canada. And, and companies have a hard time wrestling, getting their head around putting goods destined for the U.S. market in Canada. But when they take a look at if you have a large duty load on goods that are like uh, uh, clothing, footwear, um, those type of uh, articles that receive high duty rates in the United States. And there's some legacy, as I still refer to them as Trump duties, but there's 301 duties in the States as well. Those are bypassed. So there, there's some tremendous opportunities. So um, it, it's, a, it's, it's a great time to kind of look at these de minimis levels and really plan. Now, if you're in the machinery, it doesn't make sense because the duty rates aren't very high, but certainly, you know, it's time for anybody importing in the United States and you have a large portion of your uh, sales or B2C in the United States, maybe it's time to look at doing that from uh, another country and somebody close by like Canada. So, Yeah. And that's one of the advantages of working with um, Carson uh, is that uh, we can um, get a sense of uh, what is uh, industry standard and benchmarks uh, in terms of practices, because uh, we have uh, on an anonymous basis, some information about what the trends are and what uh, strategies um, that uh, folks are considering uh, when they're growing their business. Global uh, customs uh, border uh, e-commerce has, as we mentioned, uh, grown exponentially like a hockey stick, but the Auditor General in its uh, recent report indicated that uh, the CBSA has been slow off the mark to uh, make the adjustment and that uh, some uh, changes are needed to keep uh, current with the massive change in the way that business is done through e-commerce and import. So uh, we expect to see even more changes over the next little while to accommodate e-commerce. We're, you know, we've been watching this and uh, waiting for further information and, and hopefully we'll have a little bit more um, light on, on this area uh, in the next little while. David? Yeah, and, and I guess it's, it's, it's a good time to put out that uh, uh, e-commerce retail growth, um, Statista uh, reported that in 2020, that Argentina was 100% e-commerce growth and followed by Canada at 75%. And then it goes down the order in Singapore, 73%, Mexico, 65%, Russia, 54%, Australia, 53%. And the United States is well below the global growth of 25%, which is a little shocking. However, um, they were the leaders in e-commerce. And so uh, to a high degree, um, um, people are purchasing online in the United States already. So um, it, it's, it's, it, it's something that, uh, and it also pointing out Turkey is the highest retail e-commerce where 50% of the retail takes place online, which is staggering. Um, but I think it just shows you where's e-commerce going? Is there gonna be a day when uh, people won't be in stores? So um, this is very important and um, so stay tuned. Yeah, from a, from a customs agency standpoint on both sides of the Canada-US border, I think what they're facing is a deluge of imports via e-commerce. And so how do they best manage that? Uh, is the question, right? Uh, how can they better manage that? So that's what the uh, Auditor General is getting at. And uh, so the CBSA is working with this uh, WCO uh, 
working group at a little customs organization that developed a global e-commerce cross-border framework of standards. And, and that might give a little bit more um, sense of where uh, governments are heading in the near future. Um, one of the concerns is security. I think it, that uh, a lot of these e-commerce um, items go in and there's very, very little scrutiny on the security side. So, um, so uh, there's some uh, data here uh, establishing the importance of e-commerce. Uh, David uh, mentioned uh, growth uh, of 4.2 trillion. So that's gonna go up another, you know, uh, 2 trillion in the next two years. That's just crazy growth. That's just incredible. Uh, and uh, 2.14 billion people worldwide will buy goods and services online this year. That's incredible. So uh, it's, uh, it's certainly an area to focus on if you're looking at uh, growth in your business. So the WCO's cross-border e-commerce framework of standards uh, outlines uh, eight principles of cross-border e-commerce framework, uh, and uh, it includes the ones that we've listed here, advanced electronic data and risk management, so you're providing information in advance of the import, uh, simplif simplification of procedures, safety and security, as I mentioned, uh, that's been a bit of a hot button issue for the agencies. Revenue collection, uh, in the tax world, what they refer to, what, what uh, governments refer to often is tax slippage, amounts of tax that should be collected that aren't being collected. So uh, governments are, you know, especially in the post pandemic era, if we're gonna get there, uh, they're gonna be wanting to uh, find um, revenue raisers and customs and import uh, taxes are one of those potential revenue raisers and, and they wanna uh, avoid unnecessary revenue slippage, uh, tax slippage. Measurement and analysis is important. Uh, if things go in under a streamlined accounting system or uh, import system, how do you measure and analyze things? Partnerships, uh, public awareness and legislative fr frameworks are also on the hit list of, uh, uh, of items to be uh, considered under this framework. Gives you a sense of where things are going. So uh, the, there's a, an outline here of uh, the uh, models of revenue collection. Um, and uh, it says in the middle, customs administration should offer electronic payment options, provide relevant information online, allow for flexible payment types and ensure fairness and transparency, basically to get modernized, right? Uh, that's uh, the uh, impetus behind all this stuff to get more efficient and effective in dealing with e-commerce. And uh, so that's the, that's the imperative, that's the drive within the WCO framework. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, the point here is that uh, government should be, make fully informed decisions based upon specific national circumstances. And as I mentioned at the outset, uh, governments impose or provide for de minimis levels based upon their individual circumstances. And they have to do that in order to handle things like uh, revenue collection, revenue raisers are important. So in Canada, it's been determined that uh, the lower uh, de minimis levels are preferred over the higher de minimis levels in the United States. Why? Possibly because uh, Canada needs the revenue and doesn't want to let up on the road. So uh, these are individual decisions made by individual sovereigns around the world. So uh, David, uh, you put in a handy dandy uh, website here on uh, how to uh, find uh, the de minimis threshold, but I expect that your data is going to be much more accurate and up to date uh, than, uh, than any um, website. Yeah, I mean, just a word of caution. It's uh, there's some in, that's a great source to start with, but I, if you're shipping or importing from certain countries, I would definitely look to the specific customs agencies. Um, Zonos is pretty good. Most of the couriers use it. Uh, lots of e-commerce platforms use it, uh, but there's a, a few little tweakings. I, I noticed in there they've got Australia at a thousand U.S. dollars when it's not. It's Australian, but it's a it's a good place to start. 
start. And it shows you sort of the trends around the world, what's going on with de minimis thresholds. And, and I guess it's, it's a great place to point out that um, the WCO and all the member countries, they are all wrestling with um, uh, de minimis values and e-commerce because when uh, you and I go to a store and uh, the, uh, uh, our tax comes up at the cash register, uh, you can't bypass that tax. You can't just say, no, I don't want to pay that tax. However, there seems to be uh, various platforms available to people to buy online that sometimes that tax is not paid or the countries do not have a tax regime that starts with import um, and, or, the, or the cash register if they don't have a, a national tax. And so it's, it's a little unfair. And so to think that there will ever be a global de minimis value, there never will be. And there will always be protectionist uh, methods by certain countries. And certainly Canada is an example where most of our taxation is done on retail shopping. And we may have to look at in the future, how do you uh, um, uh, raise or keep taxation to ensure that all our um, uh, uh, um, you know, things that we enjoy about living in Canada are paid for and, and we can afford the salaries of our federal employees when we can't tax people at the retail cash register. So it, it's another thing that it, it's going to be changing and evolving. And anybody involved in e-commerce, it, it's, it's something that keeps up as, us up at night because certainly I'm involved in clearing goods on customs issues and if de minimis was raised to $1,000, there's certainly be a lot less goods coming into this country um, that uh, there'd be customs entries on or statistics on. So um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm overusing my, my, uh, my uh, term of stay tuned, but stay tuned and, you know, uh, keep informed. So. Yeah, I think that it, the bottom line from my perspective is that there's a tension between two imperatives, one, uh, is to ensure streamlined importation. That's you know where we're at with the de minimis stuff. Where e-commerce is growing like a hockey stick. You're getting deluged at the border with all this stuff. And uh, how do you make sure that you are accommodating all this uh, this high uh, volumes of, of low value goods coming into the country? The other part of it is protectionism and the need to have revenue raisers to pay for the stuff that we want and need in, in each of these countries. So, um, and, and you see that hit, those two worlds collide right at the point where, uh, for example, Chinese goods are imported into the US, right? So you have uh, the Trump tariffs, as you call it, uh, David, uh, these high value, uh, high level uh, tariff rates um, but they are avoided uh, if they are at the de minimis level. You don't have to pay those Trump tariffs, right? And uh, so that's, I think, uh, where you're going to see future tensions. How do governments manage this? Because we see in the United States, for example, there's no appetite for removing the tariffs that were imposed under the Trump administration right now. The U.S. sees that as a good protectionist measure, a good measure to ensure that uh, it uh, that uh, the government can uh, follow and um, adhere to the goals of uh, uh, bringing back, uh, building back better. Uh, and so those tariffs are going to stay. Uh, will the will the de minimis level stay? You know, the, 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 this is going to be an ongoing debate. On to the next uh, slide. So this is the current de minimis level here. Um, goods entering Canada from the United States or Mexico, where the value of the shipment is uh, $150.01. Uh, customs duties and taxes will be payable. Uh, where goods are entered, entering uh, Canada from the United States and Mexico by courier, where the value of the shipment is between uh, $40.01 and $50, customs duties will not be payable, but GST will be payable. So two different levels to keep in mind. If you're bringing in goods, of course, um, for, in the course of commercial activity, say you're buying goods to sell in Canada, um, the, uh, the chances are that you can recover the, the uh, GST, the goods and services tax, as an input tax credit, if you properly manage that issue.
Okay, so uh, another uh, set of, um, of facts relating to um, goods entering Canada from the United States. Uh, and uh, basically, if the uh, value for the shipment is the Canadian dollars 40 or less, customs duties GST, HST, and PST will be waived. And so we get a, you know, a sense of, of uh, what the levels are uh, from uh, it, if you want to bring in goods that are um, not subject to import duties and taxes. Yeah, and Dan, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that under $40, it goes through on a courier stream and there is no uh, formal declaration made to customs. If it, above that, there is a declaration made. So a, a broker needs to put an entry, exempt the duties, and then you're still paying GST, HST, or PST. When you get to the next slide on US, the same is in fact for the United States, anything under 800 US dollars, there is no processing. It's declared on a manifest stream. And in all intents and purposes, there is no entry as long as US Customs agrees to a crossing. Um, so, this is, uh, you know, being a service provider in the industry <clears throat> hurts me a little bit. However, it does open up tremendous opportunities for e-commerce. Um, so um, the, the service side of things is, is much more burdensome coming into Canada than it is going to the United States because of the de minimis threshold. So, Good point, David. So uh, the uh, section, as we mentioned earlier, is 321 um, in the United States, uh, which allows for um, goods uh, not exceeding $800 uh, dollars US to enter without a formal entry. And that's what we were talking about. No consumption entry, I guess, uh, in the US. Yeah. And it, it's actually worth pointing out that these are goods that aren't subject to other government agencies. If they are subject to other government agencies, uh, a big part of our practice is uh, clothing, footwear, garments, action sports. If you're involved in food products, um, pharmaceuticals, uh, any goods that are subject to other government agencies, <clears throat> there is a provision that's just been launched in the last year that you must report that to U.S. Customs and get them a proceed. So it's not a, a formal entry per se. It's actually you, you need to declare to them because um, there was a bit of a gap that was realized by the U.S. government that many uh, products were arriving onto the shelves in the United States that weren't just uh, a void of uh, duties. They were bypassing other government agencies, which are important to protect the, the U.S. Uh, population from food products and drug products that aren't allowed to be sold in the United States. So, yeah, big. Uh, there's a big online pharmaceutical business, uh, for example. I know, uh, and uh, so goods can come in uh, under the wire uh, that way. Um, and uh, so now, I, I guess, is the, there's a self-reporting mechanism where people can report what they're doing. Right. Yeah. They would report those to US FDA. They would give a pass on it. And then basically it, it falls under the $800 exemption. So, but it must be reported to the US FDA. Next slide, please. So this uh, is where the rubber hits the road in terms of where the money is. Uh, where do you put your fulfillment center, right, David? Um, because that uh, can uh, help uh, manage costs out of your business. So uh, the second bullet point here, third party logistics companies in Canada are increasingly recognizing the need to provide tailored made solutions for e-commerce um, as uh, more businesses start trading online. So as you mentioned, you may wish to say it, set up a trading hub in Canada and then export to the US or maybe it's a, uh, a, a third party uh, logistics company or a um, FTZ, I should say, in the United States and then import from the US into Canada. There are various options that are available, right? So it depends upon the business and the business line and where your market is and who you're selling to. Um, and then you can optimize uh, your uh, supply chain having regard to the um, uh, those factors. Next, uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, that, this is the bit of a fly in the ointment um, in the sense that you can't ship bulk. You have to ship, it has to be one, sh the de minimis level is per shipment, right? So you uh, have to have the individual shipments and they're not um, artificially split up that meet that de minimis level that are exported. If you start to package everything up and uh, and consolidate it as a, as a bulk order, that's when you are outside of the de minimis level. So you have to watch what you're doing. Yeah, and it's worth pointing out the last point there is, is if if you be are found out to be become an offender that where you're splitting shipments purposely to avoid paying duty and to fall under de minimis, um, the U.S. Customs, the CBP, um, or any agency that regulates the goods can request that your shipments be examined and that they can request formal entries and then they actually ban you from using the uh, de minimis program if you're a repeat offender. So it, it's very, um, um, it, it's a pretty hard and fast rule um, that you must abide by by one shipper to one consignee on one day. Now it, it's it's come up on questions if somebody's got uh, somebody in the, Mr. Smith in the United States is buying from three fulfillment centers on the same day being shipped from different places. Um, right now, CVP, and, and hopefully they're not listening, they don't have the ability to check those manifests across the country. Um, and so it seems to be a bit of a gap. I'm sure they may work on it, but at right now, um, so I, I would just say um, US e-commerce $800. If it's over that, you've got to pay if it's under that and it qualifies, it's not subject to other government agencies and you could ship away. Yeah, yeah. So if you're engaged, if this is part of your supply chain, you want to make sure that it's it's not going to be subject to adverse uh, action after an audit, um, because uh, the uh, customs agencies don't see the humor in artificially splitting up shipments. Next slide, please. So uh, here, uh, David, uh, I think this came from you as a handy dandy example. Yeah, it's really just a way to take a look at a purchase price on a, uh, uh, of a fifty dollar jacket, um, where you, if you imported directly in the United States and your shipment was worth twenty five thousand U.S. dollars, presently you would pay in the in the states duty of sixty nine twenty five, uh, plus you'd have um, eighteen seventy five is actually the additional Trump duty. These we're assuming these jackets came from China, um, so. On that, the duty load per jacket would be $17.60 um, in the United States if you imported directly in the United States. So, um, and then it, we take a look at e com sales under $800. If you brought your jackets into Canada and either were on the duty deferral program in Canada or applied for a drawback and obtained all your duty back, um, it was within four years of import. Um, you'd have no, um, uh, you'll be uh, saving yourself $17.60 per jacket on a $50 uh, jacket. So, and there's no, no duty cost per jacket and there's no processing cost at the border either. So it, it's, it's uh, becoming on companies to kind of look at that and say, wow, you know, can I sell against a competitor in the United States who has their 3PL operations in, in uh, Canada and um, they're not paying any duty, and I'm paying um, this duty. Um, so it's 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 a very simple, quick example to kind of take a look at. And that's why I said in the beginning, if you're in a um, industry that the duty is not sub um, substantial enough to warrant this, then it's not worth the exercise. But certainly garments footwear is 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 certainly the uh, the high duty rate category in the united states so yeah next slide so, right. so that yeah go ahead David. yeah so i was just going to say that's I, i'm just saying that uh e-commerce retail growth is here to stay it's uh it's growing leaps and bounds and i think it's time that um, I've certainly talked to a lot of large uh, companies in both Canada and the United States, 
And um, the companies that are based in Canada or based in Europe, uh, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, they seem to be almost targeting Canada as a way to um, set up to go after North American um, sales. Traditionally in the past, they've normally come to us and said, I'm sitting in the United States. And once I've done that, I'm going to access that little market in Canada, which is one tenth size coming to Canada. Now, because of the U.S. de minimis level, they're now calling and saying, you know what, I think instead of setting up in the United States, maybe I'll set up my operations in Canada. And at the same time, I'll sell into Canada and sell in the United States. So it's, um, I, I think a number of brands are looking at it because they're finding that some of their competitors are taking advantage of it and they just can't not look at it anymore. So if you've got any questions or if you want to discuss it, certainly reach out to myself or Dan. And I just want to thank Dan for his help today and uh, turn it back to you, Dan. To... No, thanks, David. Uh, yeah, the, the travel adage of know you before you go, I think is, the, is, is apt here. It applies in the custom situation. So make sure that you know what the levels are and, and seek out the right advice from uh, a broker such as yourself or an advisor such as Mel Thompson. Uh, in order to make sure that everything uh, works out well and you drive the costs out of the system that you intend to. Uh, and it's a competitive advantage that um, you can't give up if uh, other uh, folks are, are, are taking advantage of these opportunities, um, then it's almost required that you do so. So with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And uh, uh, I uh, hope that uh, you found this information to be informative and useful. And uh, we look forward to uh, providing you with another uh, presentation in the near future on uh, customs and global trade hot topics. And in the meantime, uh, be safe and be well. Thanks again, everyone. Take care. Bye now.